Now let me talk about the war within. At such a time of war in our world, when this generation needs the church as more than it's ever needed it, God is looking for an army of committed soldiers who join together to accomplish His redeeming work. And one of the tragedies of our time is that at this very moment when the church is desperately needed, I see the church itself in civil war. Our portion of the army of the Lord is fighting among itself. This family squabble has now gone public. We made it in Christianity today. We made it in the Stockton record. The Associated Press sent it all over the nation and around the world that we are fighting. If we wanted headlines so the world would know who we are, we got them. Christianity Today, the Associated Press picked up the story of a growing division between the supposed conservatives and the liberal factions of our fellowship. And sadly, I'm going to have to say that the stories in the newspaper were pretty accurate, and I hung my head in shame. Yesterday I had a call from one of our fine elders from another part of the nation. He said, was it in your paper? I said, yes. He said, I'm ashamed. For many years, we have privately labeled another brother as a conservative or a liberal, depending on how we view him in respect to our own convictions. If he's more tolerant in one area than we are, then he's a liberal. If he's less tolerant, then he's conservative. Along with this private branding of brethren, we have not allowed open lines of communication through which we could discuss our differences of opinion in a responsible fashion. Many brethren have felt intimidated to discuss their sincere beliefs for fear that they will be further branded and possibly excluded from their friends. What forums have existed usually are moderated in such a way as to give an unfair advantage to one viewer or another. Discussions that have taken place have been so emotionally laden and volatile that many have, avo have avoided expressing themselves altogether. The lack of open and honest communication will destroy any union, be it a marriage or a church. Into the silence slips imaginations, misinformation and rumor. In the court of each person's private thoughts, a brother or a sister can be tried and convicted based on rumor and even false testimony. I say we have been guilty of doing what Jesus told us not to do. He told us not to be judging each other. And we insist upon doing it. And we are not doing what he told us to do. He told us to love each other. And we somehow see that as being too saccharine and silly. Instead of living at Matthew 18 where Jesus told us to go with our offending brother and communicate openly, We've moved to Luke 23. Crucify him! Crucify him! It wasn't Matthew 18 that Jesus said that if we would go privately to our brother in openness and honesty, Jesus said, if you'll do it, I'll be in your midst. Where two or three. Now, we've misquoted that passage so much. He said, in context, where two or three are gathered to straighten out these differences, there will I be in the midst of them. In 1945, our fellowship was formed as a coalition of two ministerial bodies who did not totally agree in doctrine. Although they were both Jesus' name fellowships, one taught that a person should be baptized in order to remit their sins. We call it baptism, baptismal regeneration. The other group taught that baptism should be performed in the name of Jesus in celebration of the sins that were already forgiven at repentance. That was the position of these two groups. They did not totally agree on several things, the new birth, eschatology, and other issues. While they both believed in holiness, they applied those doctrines differently. One group historically was more tolerant in that area than the other. 
The elders knew that these differences existed, but they determined that they, were, they had more uniting them than dividing them. And it was at this point they decided to fellowship the difference. Would you say that with me? Fellowship the difference. Neither side would have to relinquish their convictions, but they would build on common ground. They specifically asked the brethren not to deliberately antagonize one another about these differences. It's in our articles of faith. We will not contend to the disunity of the body. They put it in there on purpose. The fundamental doctrine, our statement, faith was purposely broad to embrace all the differences that they fellowshipped. Acts 2.38 and John 3.5 was open for interpretation. As almost 50 years have transpired since that time, we find that the coalition still exists. There remains the same difference of theology among us. While the two fellowships merged for the purpose of evangelism, there has not been a merging of theology. But with the passage of years, there's grown an intolerance to fellowship the difference. There has been an increased pressure to mold us into one theological system. And this pressure has met with resistance. The question that lays before us at Landmark and every gathering where we come together is, are we still willing to fellowship the differences that our elders agreed upon? Does the compromises they made to form this union seem untenable to us now? Before we draw our swords to contend for our various views to the disunity of the body, look around you, my brethren, and see the tragedy of war. Look what's happening in civil war. There are children caught in between. There are young preachers sitting on the sidelines watching the bloodletting. We say we're fighting for their future, but we in fact may be scarring their future. There are teenagers who are so confused, they don't know which way to go. They don't want to join either voice. There are young students, and you are sitting in this audience, who've come into my office, and you're torn up because of some things where your pastor and your church may have to make decisions that you hope they don't have to make. And you're asking with those questions, what's going to happen to me? There are laymen, loyal laymen, who have enjoyed the friendship and the fellowship that has been provided, and now they're tossed into decisions about whether they can do this or go there and still fellowship with this and that. I'm reminded of a story my uncle tells in the cowboy days on the homesteads in Idaho where his neighbor had a, a big barn that was, the attic was filled with rats. And they tried everything in the world to rid that barn of the rats. And so one day one of the teenage boys decided that he'd go out there with a shotgun and he'd sit in the doorway of that thing. And every time he saw one of those rats run across the rafters or across the boxes, uh, he'd pull up with that shotgun he'd shoot it. He sat out there in the, in the door of the barn. Too long after that, here come a big old rat running across that uh, a box up on top in the attic. He pulls up with that 12 gauge and he let go with both barrels. The next thing he knew, he was about 50 feet laying on his back 50 feet down the driveway. And when he looks up, all he sees is smoke and flames, and he sees the barn is flat to the ground. Because the box on which the rat was running had dynamite in it. And he lay there with his shotgun thrown behind him, and his shirt torn and he's laying out and his family's looking to see if he's got all of his body parts. And he lays there and he looks up at his dad and he says, Dad, I believe we got those rats. Oh, yeah. <laughs> one, of the, one of the authors of the resolution presented to our fellowship made a statement, public statement, that he wanted to clean the heretics out of our movement. 
My advice to you, my dear brother, is you be pretty careful when you pull up with that 12 gauge. You may get the heretics, but you may tear the whole barn down in the process. Your side may win, but you may not have much left around which to structure. Jesus said, when they have sown tares among the wheat, when the enemy has sown tares among the wheat, Leave it alone. If there are heretics sown among the children of the Lord, you better leave it alone. After all, He's the Lord of the church, not us. He has a unique way of cleaning up His church. Stop the civil war! Stop the labeling! Stop the firing! Can't you see the children walking in the garbage heaps? Can't you see the dazed look on the young people? When you try to pull up the tares, you're going to get some wheat too. In the process, there's going to be a lot of good people going to get hurt in this purging. Paul said in Galatians 5.15, but if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed one of another. I've heard a lot of fear mongering about how our elders would be grieved at our condition today. I would agree with you that our elders would be grieved, but not because we become too worldly. I think our elders would be grieved because we have become less tolerant of each other. Our elders would be shocked that we do not put up with what they put up with in 1945. Our elders would be shocked that we don't enjoy the freedom of fellowship that they enjoyed. They would be shocked at the rules and regulations we have imposed and the narrowness of our theology. They would be shocked. I was raised by one. I know. I have an uncle up in the state of Idaho who was there and one of the original conventioners of the 45 agreement. I personally know of our elders who exchange pulpits with ministers of other denominations, even non-Pentecostals. I am speaking God's truth. As a boy, I remember a free Methodist man used to preach regularly in our pulpit. And my dad addressed him as Brother Weatherby, a fire-baptized Methodist. And he blessed our church so many times. What should be done to stop the Civil War? First of all, I think we ought to establish some forums, open forums, where our differences of opinion can be discussed in an atmosphere of brotherly love. This would be a place where we would all guarantee a brother that his views would be respected and we would have to aggressively preserve the integrity of a brother who differs with us. Secondly, I think we should allow a thorough re-examination of our past decisions and their effect upon us today. It is possible for a decision to be proper in the 50s, but it's not applicable to the 90s. Let us not unconditionally subscribe to the decisions of the past if they don't have a proper application to our present. We are going to find ourselves in concrete boots at a time of war, cemented to policies that won't let us mobilize. For instance, in certain areas of holiness, we must understand that there are some things the Bible addresses directly. And we will always follow them. There are other things the Bible deals with in principle. And the culture informs them. The application of Bible principle is sometimes informed by culture. We need to have a conference where we discuss how culture affects the church. Where the Bible is specific, we must be specific. But where the Bible gives principles, we've got to give some latitude for people to interpret those principles. I think we need to re-examine certain passages of Scripture to see if we have interpreted them properly. 
That is so threatening to some because of their insecurity. But people, God's not embarrassed by our questions. Do you think this word is so fragile that you can't take a second look at it? Are we so insecure that we can't say maybe I was wrong in that view? I'm not interested in saving my face. I'm interested in saving people. I think it's time for us to boldly and honestly tell our children our true history. I see a tendency in our movement to rewrite it. Tell the younger generation, tell them that our first general superintendent, Brother Howard Goss, referred to his friends in the Assembly of God as his brethren in Christ. I wonder, would Howard Goss be allowed in our pulpit today? But he was our first general superintendent. Tell the younger people that. Tell them how Brother Andrew Urshan used to frequently worship in the Baptist Church in Long Beach, California. And when you publish his books, don't edit out those questions about who he thinks are going to be in heaven. Go ahead and show them all the pictures of our heritage. Show them all. Show them the pictures of our elders and beards. Show them Sister Olive Haney with a little necklace around her neck out of Brother Frank Ewart's church. Now, you may not agree with the standard they held at the time, but at least tell the young people that was who they were. Don't make them out to be something they were not. The stories that sometimes the young people are getting that some of these men were wild-eyed conservative radicals when in fact that was not the case at all. Tell them that at one time there was a Trinitarian lady on the college staff taught English here. Am I right, Brother Anderson? Tell them that. Now, that's our history. I think that we ought to re-pledge ourselves to fellowship the difference that our elders fellowshiped. It's time, people, for us to recommit ourselves to 1945 principles, admitting that there are going to be compromises that we're all going to have to make, and we are willing to do it. I want to tell you, I have some of the most wonderful friends in this movement and outside this movement who disagree with me in several points. But that does not tarnish my fellowship. We need God to do a sovereign work of grace and forgiveness in our hearts. Instead of gathering in conferences to brag about how good we're doing and how wrong everybody else is, we need a place where our whole movement falls on its face before God and humbly seek His healing. What does the future hold if we continue the infighting among our fellowship family? Will we someday force everyone to believe and interpret alike? Do you foresee a day in which the different views will finally capitulate and the conservatives will give in to the liberals and the liberals will give in to the conservatives? My friend, if you're envisioning, envisioning that day, it'll never happen. Chances are that men will not relinquish their sincerely held beliefs and I don't think they ever should have to. I don't care what label is placed upon them. They should have the freedom of their conscience that they, they were guaranteed in 45. If compromise is not agreed upon and the lines of communication are not open so that healing can flow to the body, there will be an, an inevitable division. It has to. 
If a married couple can't communicate, it's only a matter of time before division comes in the house. Now that may very, be very bleak and pessimistic, but hear me. Look out on the field. Look out on the field that is white already to harvest. The biggest issue out there isn't whether you should wear a tie tack or a wedding ring. Come on, army! We have the key to their deliverance. Yes. Yes. And we're fighting over whether it should be in the front pocket or the back pocket. Instead of fighting over where the key ought to be put on the uniform, we ought to be using it. I may be controversial, but let me ask you a question. What difference does it make why people are baptizing in Jesus' name? The important thing is they are baptizing in Jesus' name. Look out, look at the children. Look at the young people. Look at the world that's drowning in the quagmire of their moral mess and they're waiting for God to send a delivering army. Look at the missionaries whose mobile homes are high centered on the controversy. We can't send them. Their progress is slowed because we are fighting. Nations wait. Peoples wait. I wonder, will we be a part of God's rescue? If we're going to be a part of the rescue of humanity in this late hour, if we're going to be of any part to rescue this nation in its moral morass, we are better lay aside some of the petty quarreling and we better get about the important business of warfare. Paul said that our enemy is not each other. That's right. We are not fighting flesh and blood. It's a spiritual battle being waged. And I think the controversies going on are a part of the devil's tactic to keep us from our real job of world evangelism. In Revelation 2... The Lord spoke to the Ephesian church. He said, you've tried the heretics and you've upheld the apostles' doctrine. He commented on them, he complimented them and all of that. But he said, but I have somewhat against you. In the process of the years, with a frame of mind of always being right, and there is a danger, my people, in always being right. Never admitting a need. Never admitting a mistake. Always being right and everyone, everybody else is wrong. In that debate, in that process, they lost the vital love of the whole religion. Lost their love that brought them together. They lost their love for their Lord. And here's what he said, if you don't repent, and if you don't return to your origin, I will remove your candlestick. Did he say it or did he not say it? He will not remove it because of their theology, because it was orthodox. He would not remove it because they were small, because they were a sizable church. But he would remove it because they had left their bridal love that was the origin and the heart of the whole thing. What will the young people think when they see us on our faces before God? What will the children think when the liberals and the conservatives pray together? What will our faithful laymen in our churches who are caught in the struggle think when they see us loving one another in spite of our theological differences? 
Will they look down upon us? No. They will respect us. They will join us. They will see Christ in our midst. He promised that where two or three gathered together in His name to settle differences and to communicate openly that He would be in their midst. Would you stand with me in closing? Would you stand on the sidelines now and let me speak to the world? Here's my letter to the world. Dear lost world, I am so sorry that in the crisis hour of your captivity, we are caught in one of our own. I know that you're caught in one of the most tragic moral dilemmas in all of history. You're trapped by the consequences of your own sins and you are captives enslaved by satanic forces. He has gained control of your schools and your families and your government. Your youth are being exploited by drugs, gangs, abuse, suicide, new age, demonic music, and abortion. Your textbooks are now sex books and your diplomas are now condoms. You can hardly read and write in spite of the increased spending on education. The church, like a mighty army of liberators, possesses the key to your prison. What you need is an accurate picture of Jesus. You need to see the unadulterated view of Christ. He will bring light into your darkness. He will bring hope in your despair. And He will bring power to your weakness. World, what you need is another Azusa Street. But unfortunately, world, we at this moment do not possess the humility of Azusa Street. Please forgive us. Even though we have the delivering gospel of a triumphant Christ, we have gotten sidetracked from our mission, arguing over whether we should carry the key in the front or back pocket. Dear world, we'll be there shortly. But first, the church needs to talk to its commander-in-chief. You're my brother, you're my sister, Take me by the hand Together we will work Till he comes There's no foe can defeat us Walking side by side As long as there is love You're my brother, you're, you're my sister. sister, so take me by the hand, together we will work until he comes. comes. There's no foe that can defeat us when we're walking side by side. As long as there is love, we will stand. Let me just talk to the Bible school just a minute. 
Friday, a student came to me, and that student knows who they are, so upset because they're about to leave the campus over arguments in the dormitories over theology. The arguments got so heated and so on both sides I believe were at fault probably. Bible college? Stop it. That's right. Look at the victims of war. So is post-tribulation. So? You're making a deal out of something that really isn't supposed to be a big deal. And there's a lot of people getting torn up and hurt in the process in your dorm rooms. You're branding. You criticize my generation for branding people liberal and conservative and you're doing it in the dorm. Who's going to stop the cycle? That's right. You know what I think needs to happen? I think some of us need to go get somebody by the hand. Somebody that may not agree with you theologically and you need to walk to this altar and kneel together and ask the commander-in-chief really at what price am I willing to destroy another brother you're my brother my sister take me by the hand Does anybody want to get a hold of a brother and sister and gather? There's no foe that can defeat us. Who's going to start the when healing? We'll walk inside the sun. As long as there is love, we will stand. Yes. You're my brother. Just because you got somebody by the hand doesn't mean they're your enemy. So, so take me back. Hand together, together we, we will, will work, work until he comes. There's no foe that can defeat us when we're walking. As long as there is love, we will stand. You're my brother. Oh, hallelujah. Speak to us, Lord. Oh, Cleanse our hearts. Purify our motives. Search us, O oh God. See if there be any wicked way in us. Lead us in the way everlasting. Hallelujah. Let the peace of God rule our hearts, I pray. inside the As long as there is love, we will stay. Take me by the hand Together we will work Until he comes And there's no foe that can defeat us When we we'll walk inside the sun As long as there is love We will stay
Can't stop myself. 